fond memories of all of them. I have recording. Okay. Welcome to the July SV Fig meeting. Uh, Zoom version. Uh, I was just saying uh, in in real life when we were meeting in Corpus, Ting would have the annual uh, July barbecue. So thanks, Ting, for all the uh, wonderful memories of July barbecues past. And uh, so without further ado, a man who needs no introduction, but I'm gonna anyway, Bill Ragsdale. And let's see, was this the, um, the testing talk or the challenge? I, I forget. I think it's, it's a uh, testing, isn't it? Kevin, you're muted. I think it's the testing talk, right? Good. Okay. Going to the, uh, the challenge will be at the end. Uh, there's this thing in Zoom where you, you hit the space bar and you're able to talk and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't depending on where the focus is. Uh, so right away. away we go. So here we go. Theme for today. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Ports Interest Group. It's July 24th, 2021. And we're gonna discuss the, some advantages and opportunities in program development, program testing. So as we all know, doing fourth, typically we do uh, testing and we do uh, programming. I'm trying to see how to get my image up on the screen. There we go. I like to see my own face as I'm talking. So as we know, with fourth, we do a lot of incremental programming and testing. By incremental, sometimes we may recompile the entire program or we could recompile uh, small sections of the program. But I think testing should match up with this. As we do uh, coding incrementally, should we should be testing incrementally. So this means each time we do a section of code, uh, we should have corresponding testing. But again, once the code is verified, then we can suppress the testing. However, every time we go back and make a major change, then we may want to go restore testing. So there's a tension between how much testing do we retain and do we rewrite testing? How do we keep it? So in this case, when the uh, code is completed, I prefer to have a complete test suite available, but only to be able to turn off and on when I wish. So when interpreting or the input to compiling, a, say, a file, we use the bracket if then else, which has the same functionality as the compile form, but they are interpreted and they work at the text level. Now, this is a very important point. They do not operate at an address level or a code level, but they operate text in, text out. The typical format would be that you have a Boolean F it encounters the square bracket F and it either execute the true part or the false part. So the if in this case would selectively compile or execute the, the uh, information after the square bracket F. If that flag is false, it will execute or compile the, the following code. And if is an immediate word, you can actually embed it into um, code, which we won't discuss today. But the key thing is that the bracket if contains a mini interpreter, and it's a little text interpreter that scans ahead in the source code, looking for the else and the then. So it is not, um, uh, it is not necessarily, it, uh, it can execute code in between, but its function is to scan ahead and look for the if or for the else and the then. Now, if we want to build this into test sequences, we need to make the if a little bit smarter and a little more selective. So here's my variation on the, on the square bracket if. First, we set up a value called test limit. Now, this value can from be from zero to, to n, uh, unlimited value, positive number, zero or greater. 
and this limits which tests will be executed. Then the only new little element I've added is what I'm calling star if. This is a variation on the word if, and it looks back at test limit and is selectively engaged. So if you look at the definition of star if, we take the test limit and we look to see if it's equal to or greater than the input value and develop a Boolean. And then we do a quick uh, uh, recovery of test limit and an AND. The effect on this is that if AND is zero, then you get a false. Uh, however, if the test limit is equal to or greater than the parameter is encountered, the code will execute. So this is our selective. Uh, F becomes selective based on a leading number, which is the test number. And at the bottom, there's this uh, if CR, CR then. That just helps in formatting, uh, make the printout look a little bit nicer. So as I said, the, the if star if accepts the test number, compares to the limit. If it's greater or equal to, then it interprets the following code till then. So it just, it either skips to then or it doesn't. Uh, here's a D chart of what the code looks like, just as you would expect. At the top left, you input with a, your code that you're testing, and then you give it a test number n, and then execute star if. If you're within the desired test limit range, it will execute the test code, give you a report, and then continue with then. If the uh, test number doesn't uh, uh, activate the if part, it skips directly to the end. So the test will either ex execute or not. Here's an example of using star if. Uh, top right, we have an, a, the eight in red. So this is test number eight. It's passed to if. If this is, uh, if test is activated for eight or greater than, the following executes. Uh, the dot paren is just a little comment that displays. And then the following couple of lines is from my matrix fourth which generates a random matrix and then lists it. There's a three by three matrix. Uh, a sub matrix is activated, random number under a thousand is placed there. And again, if this test is activated, here's what we see. Uh, the output on your screen then shows eight, which is the test number and the introductory part, which is a test of subroutine and then the actual code. It can be a little more involved. The actual test itself can be conditional. So in this case, we have a code module. We're activating it with the, with the star if. And then inside the test routine, there's a couple of choices. So there's an if then else in that format. And we see here how the operator is being tested. We see this is test number four, and it's a test of plus minus times and divide. So we do in blue, we have a little simple set of uh, parameters being tested. We input the number 100, the number 500, add them together to get 600. Number 200, subtract it, we get 400. Number four and divide, and the result should be 100. So then we give it the desired result, which is 100 equal. So this is tested, the output of that sequence is at 100. Then we encounter the square bracket if, this should be true and we'll get the message got expected 100. If for some reason the parameters are wrong or the um, operators have an error, we'll get the message uh, error in math operators. And then four bells. Uh, I include typically a bell signal in the failure mode so that in this case, it rings the bell four times, which uh, uh, by, by hearing tells me, oh, you failed on test number four. And of course, you'll see it on the screen. So the output in this case, since this test uh, does operate, we'll see the output of uh, test number four, and we say got expected 100. Now, if for some reason it fails, then we would see as the alternative, uh, test four has failed. We got an error in the math operators, and we get ding, 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 ding. There's a little bit more involved in testing. This uh, test number seven. Um, it, it's actually testing, executing, and compiling. The code itself creates a matrix four by four. Uh, the uh, numeric area, area there in between the brackets loads that uh, manually, and then we list it. So this is a way to initialize a four by four matrix. And the A list will show the matrix. Another way to fill it though is in a compiled form. So this little right brace fill is a compiled instruction to load the matrix. And again, we're testing that. 
So toward the bottom, we see a four by four with zeros to clear it. Then we fill it, we list it, and then finally we forget it. So in this case, code is being created, compiled, and forgotten all within a test routine. And this is what we see. If the test works properly, test number eight of the three operators on loading a matrix. And we see at the first section, it's loaded incrementally. And then the second section is loaded from a compiled command. Here's real life. This is actual testing of a thousand line program, which is my matrix suite. We actually see the tests as they're occurring and now we'll review them in reverse operation. There are 21 different tests. They're generating matrices, they're testing. Sometimes it's just a report. Uh, sometimes there actually is a, a message, a qualified message uh, indicating a, a correct operation failure. We're right back at the beginning of it now. And you see the test number one was testing of stack depth. It was testing a word on size valid. It was testing an RC valid and it was testing within. These are error conditions. So it was testing four different error conditions, which was at the very basis of this program. Then we generate a matrix with create and we do a hex dump of it, which is a good start. And then through on uh, throughout this test suite. And again, we can incrementally test only the last routine we're working on. If we move that test limit number up each time, we'll only test the last uh, segment. Um, many times on this, I've gone back and I have regenerated the entire program with some very basic core changes. In that case, I reset the test number, test limit back to one, and it retests the entire suite. So we have two situations. One of them would be if we load with full testing for a time comparison, this takes 5.5 seconds. That was the sequence we just saw. So we're testing the full thousand line um, program. That's about five seconds. And very often I just leave it set at this value because the five seconds every time I recompile is, is kind of not, not too disconcerting. On the other hand, if I want, I can, uh, I can move that number up. Once I'm on a production basis, I set the uh, test limit to zero. And at that time, every time this suite is recompiled, it takes 26 milliseconds and uh, no test reports are given. So here's why we are doing this. The benefit is that when we start doing our programming, we're thinking about each code segment, each word, each little series. Uh, it's fresh on our mind. We're thinking about it at that point. It's the best time to generate test methods. Used to be I would generate a couple little test words and then blow them away and then do some more programming, generate a couple of test words, blow them away. In this case, now I preserve them. So as I write each test method, it's written. And in fact, often I resolve or refine the test method a couple of times before I uh, before it, was, it added in permanently. And then with this, I can reuse tests when needed. I find some prior art on this. Uh, um, Ulrich Hoffmann in Germany did a paper in the um, Euro 4th 2019 on the testing. Uh, in the work that the Europeans have done, they have carried on the fourth standards work in the called 4th 200X. And they have um, a working document there on a, a continuity on fourth standards. And it has a test suite built in. So the Annex F gives a test sequence there very innovative, uh, very brief, very forth-like because it's quite cryptic. Each test series is one line. So um, uh, it's informative. And then finally, uh, there was uh, on GitHub, I found another uh, simple test routine. In conclusion, I'd like to thank Andrew McEwen and Tom Zimmer. I always credit them because they developed Win 432, which I've been using with great success and also thank the European tomb who uh, updated it in the early 20s, early 2000s. The uh, two talks here are, uh, are going to appear uh, very shortly on um, GitHub and the, under the matrix fourth word set. And uh, also I have a 90-page um, manual I've written on, on Win32 fourth. And so you can find it also on GitHub. 
And that is it. Do we have any questions or comments? Um, you know, one comment, uh, you mentioned that uh, writing tests immediately after the production code is the best time to write the, write the test. Um, in the commercial software world nowadays, um, not just in forum, but uh, other programming languages as well, there, the, um, the consensus is to actually write the tests immediately before the production code. Uh, and then you write the code um, to uh, make sure that the, that the test passes. And a large, a large part of that comes from, um, um, apparently uh, it, it is a significant, uh, it is a frequent enough error that if you write a test, um, your code will probably compile, or if it doesn't, uh, or if it, if it does compile, it might even, even work. Um, uh, especially in larger code bases. Um, and so basically it's a, uh, and so it's a way of uh, confirming that, uh, um, what do I wanna say? It's, it's basically a way of getting intellectual control over the symbols that you're using to define the production code. Um, there's like this whole ecosystem and, and community growing up around it called test-driven development. Um, and I remember when when seeing it for the first time, like uh, I remember, I remember saying, it. "Hey, we do that in the fourth community too." And so it's it's good to see some of the uh, um, some of the culture, I guess, leading into uh, the more professional software development world. That's an excellent point, um, uh, be because I didn't I didn't mention it, but but. Lately, as I use this, I, if, the, if the word I'm writing is particularly complicated, um, more than just a little one-liner, I will write the test routine first. And the value on that is it helps me mentally structure what the complicated word is gonna be like. So as I write the test routine, I'm actually thinking, uh, I'm forced to think then through what would be the format of what I'm testing and then I go back and actually write the, um, the actual word itself. In this matrix fourth, I'm working on some of the very low level words, the very core low, low level words are extremely complicated because um, if you're manipulating three matrices, you have up to 24 parameters on the stack. And um, so again, as, as you said, as Sam said, uh, uh, think about writing the test routine first. Good, very good point. Anyone else? Okay, I yield the floor back to our fearless leader, Kevin. It reminds me of a phrase uh, from a Larry Niven novel about a particular uh, alien uh, species uh, who had uh, people uh, more or less in charge. Those who lead from behind. Uh, anyway, uh, the next item on our, uh, dare I call it an agenda, is uh, coming attractions at the Vintage Computer Festival. I assume that nobody has told me that I forgot to unmute, so you must be me. Uh, I have put in the chat a link to the uh, coming Vintage Computer Festival with the dates. Uh, there is, in particular, one presentation, one booth of interest. David Henderson has fourth and more. So uh, read the chat and uh, that should be interesting for you. Uh, so uh, without uh, putting too fine a point on it, uh, there hasn't been any uh, substantial fourth at the Vintage Computer Fair for many years. Uh, I remember, uh, I think I, I wore this t-shirt that year. It was uh, quite a while ago. And uh, if you can uh, happen to be in the area those days, I strongly encourage it. All right, Dr. Ting is